You're not supposed to turn your back on people, but for this I had to. Um, <laughs> fun and Ecclesiastes, two words. I never thought would be in the same sentence. Uh, my name is Chase, one of the pastors here. A couple weeks ago, uh, it's been a few weeks now, I was driving home from work. I drive down St. Joe, and uh, I was driving down St. Joe Highway, and I was slowing down to pull into my neighborhood, and this car went past me, and, and it caught my eye because it was a nice-looking car. And the only thing I know about cars was that it was red, um, that it was sporty, and it was expensive, I could tell, I could tell. It was probably, probably a Corvette or a Lamborghini or a Honda Civic because they all kind of look the same to me, <laughs> to be honest. Like, I'm not a car guy. It like, could have been a Ford Rabbit if you know what those are, so that takes you way back. I just, I just know it was fancy, okay? I know it was a sports car. And it flew by me and it was nice and it was expensive and it was pretty and I was like, ooh, that's cool. And it, and it was red. And then what really caught my attention, though, is as, as I slowed down, it kind of got in front of me, and I was turning, and I started laughing because I saw the license plate. And I know all license plates are capital letters in the same font, but this one I feel, I feel like he got it bolder and bigger, okay? And this license plate said atheist on it. And so I, I actually laughed just because I don't know why, but that was my first thought. I was like, <laughs> that's funny. And then... <laughs> I don't know. It's, this is true. And then I was like, man, that guy is probably enjoying his life. He seems pretty successful, at least in the realm of being able to afford this Honda Civic, you know, or whatever it really was, this really expensive, nice sports car. Like, like at least in that realm, he, he seems to have a successful, happy, probably in his mind, relatively fulfilling life. And then literally the next thought as I started driving through my neighborhood, I, I kind of felt bad. Because I realize that this man will never live the life he was intended to live if he continues to be an atheist. He's never going to be fully satisfied and find real meaning and purpose to this life if he continues to live it apart from God. And I, and I drove home just a couple more minutes around the block and I was just like, man, that's, that's tough. I, I mean... He's never going to see what it knows to be fulfilled and satisfied because he's probably looking into the things of this world. He's probably asking himself whether he realizes it or not. There's a question deep within him that's saying, what's the point? Like, what's the point of life? And, and the reason I tell you that story is because we're in a series looking at that book called Ecclesiastes. And the main purpose and question that he's asking is, what's the point? Like, what's the purpose to life, and how do we find meaning and fulfillment in life? And Ecclesiastes, if you don't know, it's this really cool book that's like, like a journal on steroids, uh, like a little diary, and he, it's really real and raw and kind of depressing and kind of funny at times and, and kind of strange. And what he's doing through like 11 of the 12 chapters is kind of pointing to this question, like, what is the point? And he's trying to fulfill and tell us what that point is. But the main point of the book is this, that you cannot find meaning or purpose to the life apart from God. Now, I'm not saying, nor is the writer saying, that if you don't believe in God, your life has no purpose. Listen, very clearly, all life has value because we're made in the image of God. And as soon as that life is life, God says, I value that and I love that and that's important to me. All life has value, whether that life grows up to, to believe in God or not, that life is valuable to God. So he's not saying that if you don't believe in God, that your life has no purpose. What he's trying to say, what I think he's trying to say, is if you live your life as if God doesn't exist or as if God doesn't matter, you cannot find real meaning or purpose in this life. There's a lot of people that believe God exists, but God doesn't matter to their life. He doesn't impact how they live. And if he's, he's saying, if you live in that way, where God is not real or God does not matter to your life, then you're going to have a hard time finding purpose and meaning and fulfillment because you cannot find it apart from God. The way he says it throughout this book over and over again, he says things like this. I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. And he uses this phrase, under the sun, 29 times. 
And what he's meaning when he says that is a life that doesn't account for the things above the sun, if you will. A life that is all about the earth and the world and the things you can find in creation. The life that doesn't think about things outside of the sun, meaning God or eternity. A life that is all about the here and now. He's saying if that's your worldly perspective, a life under the sun, you will search and you will find and you will not be satisfied because it's all, it's all meaningless under the sun. Now, it's not very encouraging at this moment, um, but what he's trying to get across is that there's something within every single one of us, uh, uh, an empty bucket, if you will, that we want to fill with meaning and purpose. We want to find meaning and purpose and satisfaction. We want that. And every single one of us, whether we realize it or not, has this bucket inside of us that needs to be filled. And what he's saying is, if you're looking under the sun, you'll never fill it. It can only be filled by God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That, that's kind of his purpose is that only God can fill it. So he takes us on this journey. And to get there in chapter 2, which we're going to talk about today, what he does in chapter 2 is he says, hey, I went and searched the world to try and find meaning and purpose and fulfillment in the things under the sun. I did the research for you. And I still found nothing. <laughs> but he takes us on this really fun journey and that's what we're going to look at. We're going to unpack it. And, and because my brain likes to visualize things, I spent a long time on an illustration that in my mind is really, really good. And when it comes out, you're going to be like, oh, or you're going to be like, wow, just lean to the wow for my sake. Okay. But what I started thinking about is we all have a bucket that's wow. empty. Wow. You're already stuck. Guys, guys, all I did was, all I did was draw, let, I just wrote on this. There's nothing, we haven't even got to it yet. All right, calm down. That was too much. That was fake. Uh, <laughs> I felt it. But we all have a, an empty bucket trying to fill it in this life with purpose and meaning. And we're all searching for something. And, and what he does is he's going to try and fill it with things in this world. And that's going to be, that's going to be fun for the little bit. I'm going to just move less. Okay, guys, I don't know if I told you, um, I'm excited today. <laughs> I didn't have any caffeine yet. This is all just me, all right, and God's word, and I get excited about the Lord, and so if you hear that noise, that just means I'm moving too much, so I'll just I'll have to walk around like this, all right? So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to read you 10 verses, then we're going to unpack it, and we're going to have a little illustration to hopefully help drive something home, because I've learned over the years that you can say something or you can display something, and for me, if you s display what you want to say, it normally sticks a little bit more, so that's what we're going to do today. So let me read this, and then we'll talk it out a little bit and see how it applies to our world and our life today. Here's the writer. He says, I said to myself, hey, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in this life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness that most people find during their brief life in this world. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself, planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks and filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate the many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks and more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of gold and silver and treasures of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women. I had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed. Anything I wanted, I would take. Denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. Now, I know that was a lot. But again, just you're going to insight into my brain. When my brain started seeing this, I, I started forming this picture of, of buckets and how we try to fill our life with things. And what I saw from him is that he tried three things, if you will. These are kind of my summaries of the three things I saw him trying in there. He tried pleasure. He tried possessions. And he tried power or influence is probably a better word. But, you know, pastors like to have words that, you know. I'll start with the same letter. So we just, we just did that for you today. Pleasure, possessions, and power. And that's what I started to see is that we all have this void, this bucket that we're trying to fill in our life. We want to find purpose and meaning and satisfaction. So we need to fill it. And the writer's the same. And he said, I tried it all. And so let me un unpack a little bit of what he said. He said, he said first, he said, come, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in this life. There are a lot of things in this world that can bring, bring us 
pleasure. And he tried a few. And the few that I saw him kind of highlight that I'll just pull out was he said, um, I decided to cheer myself with wine and I had many beautiful concubines. He said, I'm, for our talk today, I'm going to talk about drink and food. Like he said, through drink and food, which let's be honest, like food is, we like it. That's why they call it Happy Meals. You know what I'm saying? We like Happy Meals. We don't talk about it much from this stage because, you know, that's not, my, that's not my jam that I go to. But we like Happy Meals. Okay? And, and so food and, and wine, like it can bring us happiness and we, we, we want to seek pleasure in that. And then he also said concubines. And, and what he means by that is, is sexual intimacy. See, if you don't know what a concubine is, a concubine is someone that's not your wife that you do things with that, that should only be done with your wife. You know what I'm saying? Do I need to explain more? Okay, good. Because <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> Ask your mom when you get home. All right? But that, that's kind of what... <laughs> That's kind of what he's talking about. So what he's trying to tell us is he's trying to say that I sought after intimacy to find fulfillment and pleasure. And actually, we believe Solomon is the one who wrote this. And other places in scripture, it says that he had 300 concubines and wives, more wives than he had concubines. So I'm just saying, if there's any man that tried to figure out how to find fulfillment and satisfaction through intimacy... Solomon was the guy that tried. He said, I looked for these things and meaning and purpose and satisfaction and, and tried to fulfill it. And to be honest, we look at him, we say, wow, that's crazy, but we're not much different. Our society today, we try all the time to be satisfied and fulfilled and find meaning and purpose through intimacy and food. Like when it, when it comes to intimacy, I, I started writing this down. I started thinking, you know, our modern day concubine is pornography. It's where we don't have to work really hard. We don't have to build relationship. We just, we just go to it for satisfaction. We can turn it off when we're done. And we didn't have to like, do you, do you understand? It's the same kind of thing. But then I realized, honestly, in our society, we're, we're doing the same thing they were doing. We just don't call them concubines. M many people in our world today have multiple partners that they, they participate in sexual int intimacy together and they're not married. They're doing things with their spouse that are only intended to be done with your spouse. So you and I have tried in our life to find fulfillment and satisfaction in pleasures of this world. We try food and we try drink and, and many people try drugs or some substance to give us satisfaction. We live this life that if it feels good, we do it. If it makes me happy, it should be happening. That's kind of our philosophy when it comes to pleasure. So what I started seeing and, and what I think he wants us to understand is, is I, I took pleasure and I tried to find purpose and meaning in my life through pleasure. And at first it seems like it was going to work. It's like, wow. Wow. <laughs> at first it started to fill me up. I started to, to like it. It was enjoyable. It was good. But then, then I realized like, it's just kind of empty me. Like, it doesn't really last. It's, it's satisfying for a moment, for a season, but it doesn't really fulfill me and give me purpose and meaning to this life. That's what he's trying to say. That's what he's trying to help us understand. Actually, in Proverbs chapter 21, it says this. It says, those who love pleasure become poor. Those who love wine and luxury will never be rich. You'll never be satisfied. If you're living for this and looking for purpose in this and trying to be satisfied and fulfilled, and find meaning through that stuff, it just, it just doesn't work. It just won't work. So he said, I moved on. I, I tried possessions. I tried possessions to fill the void. He, he wrote things like this. I tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself, planted beautiful vineyards, made gardens and parks, filled them with all kinds of trees. Cool. I also owned large herds and flocks more than any of the kings who had ever lived in Jerusalem. I collected great sums of silver and gold and treasures of many kings and provinces. I had everything a man could desire. If I wanted it, I took it. This guy had money, houses, trees, <laughs> and animals. How many of you wish that you could have more flocks and herds than anyone else in the world? One and a half. All right, good. All right. <laughs> First service, there was no farmers in the room, all right? But there's at least some wannabes in here, right? Like, they were like, oh, cool. But listen, think about it in our world today. If I said, how many of you wish you could have more money than anyone in the world? I mean, I'm going to sit in the back going. More cars, more toys, more stuff. Like, 
Like we all want that. We all live for things. In our world today, we wouldn't be saying like, I, I searched after herds and farm animals and cows. We'd be like, I want more toys. I want more money. I want more silver and gold. I like that. We know this because back to McDonald's, why is it coming up my sermon again? You know, we don't just want a large fry. We want it to supersize, right? We don't just want big. We want bigger. We don't just want one car. We need two. And we want it at a deal. Buy one, get one. We call it a BOGO. Okay? <laughs> Like, we have names for this idea of, like, less is more. No, more is more. That's the world that we kind of are living in, right? I mean, don't, don't lie to ourselves. Like, that's kind of where we're at. We think that the more money, the more stuff, the more toys, the more things we have equals more satisfaction. There's songs out there. I see it. I like it. I want it. I got it. There's a cave bop version, so I have kids, so we, we sing that one in the past. <laughs> So what we do is we do the same thing that we did with pleasure. He says, I tried to fulfill my life with purpose and meaning through possessions, through money, through stuff. And again, it's not that it was all bad. It just didn't last. Wow. Like it was okay, but it just didn't. <laughs> all right. You know, you're overdoing it, but I'm okay with it. All right. So <laughs> it just doesn't fully satisfy because it was never meant to fill the void and give us meaning and purpose. This is why you know and I know that, that money and stuff and possessions is, is good. Like there's happiness in it. it. It does bring some satisfaction. But you know there are people out there that have everything they ever wanted and they still don't have what they need. They're still deep down inside. They're just not satisfied. In 1 Timothy 6, it says this, people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. That's intense. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have even wandered from the true faith and placed themselves with many, pierced themselves with many sorrows. I want to say this very clearly. Money and possessions are not bad or evil. They're not, but look at these words. Those who long for this, those who love this, those who crave this, if you're searching for this, seeking this, and your life is built on how much can I get, you'll find yourself plunged into ruin and destruction. It won't work. Even Christians who trust in God and believe in Jesus, have found themselves wandering away from the faith because although they know Jesus is what they need, they're still trying to live a life pursuing all the money and resources and stuff that they can get. And so they try to find meaning and purpose and fill their bucket with the wrong kind of thing. And that's what he tried. And he kept trying. And the same is true for power, or you could say influence. I saw these words, and that's just what I thought of. He says, I bought slaves, both men and women, hired wonderful singers, both men and women. I became greater than anyone who had ever lived in Jerusalem before me. And when I saw that, I saw that he had a lot of people that were underneath his authority and influence and power in his life. And, and I saw that, and, and I, I started thinking of power and started thinking of in our world today, what does that mean for us? Like we have what we call social media influencers. People that make a living influencing you and me. Like we want more influence. If we could have more likes, more shares, more follows, we have more influence because we believe there's more power in that. We believe that the higher we get on the organizational chart at work, the more happiness we'll have because leaders have it better than everyone else. And we think with power and influence, that gives life meaning and purpose. So there's so many people in this world today that just that is their drive to succeed, to be known, to be loved and liked, to have influence and power. And so that is what they do. They do the same thing that Solomon tried to do. They say, maybe with power it will work and I'll, I will try to gain influence and I will try my best. And maybe for a season it worked, maybe for a moment it felt good. But if you're trying to fill your life with this and only this, It's my fault. I asked for it. I ain't mad at you. It's on me. All right. I'll learn my lesson. <laughs> just enjoy your own. And just use, use to keep going. It's going great. <laughs> See, he, he found this that when he tried to fulfill it, although there's, there's some pleasure in that. He even said, I found pleasure in hard work. He said, the hard work I did, achieving things and accomplishing things and, and building things, like there was some pleasure in that. He said that. 
He said it filled it up a little bit, but he, he ultimately recognized that this will not last. Because his conclusion for this little section in chapter 2 is found right here in verse 11. As I looked at everything I had worked hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. And we don't have time for this, but if you keep reading, he reads on to um, talk about wisdom in the second part of chapter 2. He says, not only did I try pleasure and possessions and power, I also tried getting smarter, gathering wisdom. And it's funny because he said, man, what I've discovered was that the wise person and the fool, they both die. That's what he said. And when he talked about all this hard work and gathering all this stuff, he actually said, at one point he said, and all the hard work you do and all the things you accomplish, you die and then you leave it to someone else and you're going to trust that they're going to do something good with it? It's meaningless. There's no real value and purpose in the things under the sun to give your life meaning. That's what he discovered. That's what he discovered. Now, most of you in the room, because you chose to come to church today, you at least kind of thought that you knew this. You're like, yeah, that makes sense. We're in church, and we know what does fill the void. God, Jesus, any one of those works. Remember, if you're ever asked a question, you don't know the answer, the answer is Jesus. It's always right. No one can get mad at you for that. What's two plus four? Oh, Jesus. He knows everything. Okay, if you're struggling in school, you get to that multiple choice thing, it's like other Jesus. All right? Free lesson. But you and I know that, that real meaning and purpose and fulfillment, we're sitting in church. If I said anything other than Jesus, you should leave. So we get that. And I know that you know that. But the question I want to ask you today is do you live like you actually believe that is true? Do you actually live like you believe that Jesus is where you find true hope and meaning and purpose and fulfillment for your life? Every week we've been going to, we're going to go to the end of the book because he writes 11 chapters to help us see that life is meaningless under the sun, but then he writes one chapter to point to this one conclusion that he happens to make, and in chapter 12 says this. It says that that's the whole story. That's everything I could tell you. All the work I've done, now here's my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. What he says is, the answer is God. Fearing God and following his ways. You could say honoring God and living after God's way for life. Or you could say glorifying God and following Jesus. That's how I kind of think about it in my mind. That we're all called to glorify God and follow Jesus. Nothing under the sun can satisfy, but Jesus, who is the son of God, gives our life meaning and purpose. And, and as I read scripture, I see that Jesus is a rock on which I stand. I see that Jesus is a solid foundation. I see that Jesus will, will never ever let you down, that he will fill your life to the full and give you meaning and purpose and satisfaction, and you're like, yeah, I know. I mean, you probably knew some of this was coming. He's going to say Jesus at some point. He has to. It's in his contract. <laughs> um, I guess as most of us are tracking so far, but my question again is not do you know this, but do you live like you actually believe this? And this is where it gets interesting because for me, I gotta be honest with you, even as I was writing this and thinking through this, I was like, okay, what do you do with that? Because if I'm being open and real with you, I like the pleasures of the world sometimes, and there are stuff and possession and, and things that I'm pursuing after. There's money that I'm trying. I want to make more money. I want to get more things. I, I actually have asked God for more influence in my life. I've never said the word power because that seems prideful. God, give me more power. But I have asked for more influence, to be honest with you. So how do we reconcile that, that we want that kind of stuff, the things under the sun, but I know that Jesus is enough? And here's what I started thinking. I know this. If, if I lost all of the possessions that I have, if I lost all the power or influence that I currently have, which is, I'm a dad, so I have like this much. <laughs> like if I lost all of that influence or power, if, if, if I never got anything else that would, that would give pleasure and satisfaction and happiness in my life, I know this, and I believe this is true, that Jesus is enough. If I got nothing else in this world, I believe with all my heart that Jesus truly, truly, truly is enough 
for me. And I believe that, that he's enough for you. And, and when that is your true like perception and perspective on life, if you really see life that way, that, hey, I got Jesus, I got all that I need, then I don't think you have to disregard all of this. But we have to start here. And so what I have learned to discover is that there is a way for us to use and view and enjoy much of the things that are under the sun. That it is possible for, and I would actually say it is important for us to not disregard those things, but instead use them to do what? Glorify God. Fear God. Follow his ways. Glorify God. Follow after Jesus. I really believe with all that I am that we can use these things to bring God glory. And that shifts our perspective a little bit than, than what the world actually says. We don't find satisfaction and meaning and fulfillment in them, but we use them to glorify God. So what I started thinking is that, well, to do it right, you need a filter. And so I just kept going with the illustration because I was already there. So I called it um, God's glory filter. You could call it honoring and glorifying God filter that you and I need to run these things in our life through a filter to make sure that we're asking the question, does this thing that I'm seeking after giving me pleasure, does it glorify God? Do these things that I own, these things that I want, can I glorify God with it? Is this God's way of life? Ecclesiastes says, fear God and follow his ways. First Corinthians, I think, is like the greatest, what I call, filter that we need to have in our life to run things through. It says, whether you eat or drink or whatever. Everybody say whatever. Whatever. I like it when you say that. It's kind of fun. Whatever you do. Well, Chase, what about work? Whatever. Well, what if I work this job? Whatever. In whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. In whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The question you have to ask yourself over and over again in life is, is this going to glorify God? Is this follow after the way that God has intended for me to live? We don't pursue these things for meaning, but we use them for God's glory. That's the purpose. So we take pleasure and we say, okay, I got to run it through God's filter in my life. Will this honor and glorify God? And the thing is, as you can see, a lot of things in this created world, God created so that we could enjoy. That's the good news. There's room. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is all we need. Jesus is our foundation, but he allows us to enjoy the created things in this world. But, but maybe you can't tell yet, but there are certain things that have to get filtered out in your life if you're going to honor and glorify God. There's a lot of pleasures in this world and a lot of things that Jesus and God give us to enjoy, but you got to filter some stuff out. I want to tell you something. God designed intimacy. It was his idea in the first place, not the internet's. This was God's design, and God, God said that we can enjoy it when we do it his way. There are pleasures in this world that God intended us to enjoy, and sexual intimacy is, is one of those things. We can enjoy it. Food and wine and, 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 and those kinds of things, they're all good when they're done God's way. Listen, alcohol in moderation with regards to the needs of others and not for the purpose of coping or giving your life purpose can be enjoyed. But they're things that have to get filtered out, things that aren't godly and that are not good and that will not allow you to glorify God. You know what gets filtered out? Pornography. There's no way you can honor and glorify God. And look at that. You just can't. That's not God's intended design. You know what gets filtered out? Sex outside of the covenant of marriage, like outside of this, this promise for forever. Like that needs to get filtered out. Because that doesn't bring God honor and glory. Any sort of intimacy that is not in line with God's intended design, we need to filter out of our lives. You know what gets filtered out? Getting drunk, not being sober-minded, not being in control of your senses. Because it doesn't honor and please God. So we have to run all of these things that the world offers as good and pleasurable. We have to say, okay, cool. But what honors God? Can I glorify God with this? Is this God's way for me to do this? So we do, the same thing with, we do the same thing with possessions. We say, okay, what about possessions? We need to filter those things out. So we put our filter on and we start to think through, does this fit God's way of life and does it glorify God? Remember, money and possessions, those things aren't evil. I believe that you don't have to be poor to be holy. I don't see that in scripture. But if you're living for money or for stuff 
or you're seeking to try and find purpose or satisfaction in the things of this world, in money, in possessions, and stuff, then those things need to get filtered out. Well, but when we handle money in God's way, we hear things like, it's better to give than receive, that we should share what we have. We hear things like this uh, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I love this because it tells us some really cool things about money, how to handle it God's way. It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. Don't trust in your money. It will let you down. The trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. God cares for us and takes care of us and gives us things so we can actually enjoy them. So tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works, generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they'll be storing up treasure as a good foundation for the future that, so that they may experience true life. When our trust is in God and our purpose is found in Jesus, then it doesn't have to be in money. God takes care of our needs and then gives us what we need for enjoyment. I love that. But then we take our money and our possessions and we do this with it. Use it to do good. Be generous and share. You want to know how to handle possessions and money God's way? Use them to do good. Be generous and share. That's it. It doesn't say be poor. It doesn't say don't ever get any more. It doesn't say enjoy. Don't enjoy the things that God has given you. No, it says enjoy them. Use them to do good. Share and be generous. What I started to see as I started to pour this out, what you'll see is that as you filter the things, the possession that comes our way, you filter it through God's way. There's some stuff that has to get out of there, some stuff we shouldn't have and shouldn't mess with and shouldn't deal with because it doesn't glorify and honor God. But instead of it, it running out the bottom, it now does what? You see it? It overflows. And I started picturing this picture of everything I've always thought about God is everything that God has given me and everything that God has given you, he has given so that you would allow it to overflow and bless those around you. I, I really, really believe that that's the purpose of it. I don't need anything else. I have Jesus. I'm good. But if I, if I get more stuff and I earn more money and I have more possession or more influence, what I want to start doing is using that to give God more glory. Using my influence and power to point more people to Jesus. Because the same is true about power, that it's true about possessions, that we begin to filter it out, make sure that we're not living to promote me. We filter it out so that we can honor and glorify God. When you're no longer living for influence, but you're living for God, then your influence can be for his glory. What? Wow. I said it fast, but it was kind of cool. When you're no longer living for influence, but you're living for God, then your influence can be for God's glory. That, that's kind of the point and the purpose. We don't live to please people nor to elevate ourselves. We live to please God and make more of him. John 3, 30 says this. It says, he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. John's talking about Jesus. He says, hey, my life, when it comes to Jesus, as I become less, he becomes greater. My purpose for gaining influence and power in this life is so that I can point more people to Jesus. That's it. That's it. And guys, when, I, when I ask God for influence, I've asked over and over again, God, I want, I want to grow in my influence for other people, but I'm sure there's a little bit of pride in me because we all have a little bit of sin in our life. And there's a little bit of pride that wants to make a little bit more of Chase, but I promise you this, my heart and desire is to always filter that out so I can say, God, I just want more people to know you. You must become greater and greater, so I must become less and less. See, when we have all we need in Jesus, God takes care of our needs. We get to enjoy what we have, and then we get to share it and be a blessing to others. And when this is your perspective about life and the things under the sun, God gets glory as your source of purpose and hope and meaning, and you find enjoyment in the creation of the world that he placed you in to enjoy, and then you and I get to share it with people. Like, there's nothing better in this life than to have the right perspective and say, man, God, if you give me more, I want to find ways to bless others. That doesn't mean that if you get a second car, you have to give it away. But it might mean you can let someone borrow it. That, that was simple and silly, but you're supposed to at least half laugh. Like, it doesn't mean that you can't have a nice house, but it might mean you should invite people over and feed them every once in a while. Like, that's what we're called to do. Share, be generous, and use what God has given you to do good. We don't need anything under the sun for meaning and purpose. We, we have all we need in Jesus. 
He fulfills us. He sustained us. He's a rock on which we stand, firm foundation. He will never let you down. I know that to be true. He won't. But as we live our life following after his way of life, I do think we can enjoy the things that he's created. When we filter them through and say, hey, if this doesn't honor God, I don't want to do it. But if I can glorify God with this, I'm going to enjoy glorifying God and enjoy this life while I wait for the next one. And I've said it over and over again. There is no better life than a life following after Jesus. I I can promise you one thing, and that's that. There's no greater life. There's nothing else you're going to find greater purpose or meaning for than what you were created for, and that's Jesus, a relationship with him. And so if you don't have that today, start there. Invite Christ to come into your life. And then start to see the things that he has given you, the things that are in this world, the things that are under the sun. Start to see them and see how you can use them to glorify God and bless others. Because as cliche as it is, you and I have been blessed to be a... A what? Uh Uh-huh. A blessing. (laughs) We've been blessed to be a blessing. Thanks, God. Thanks for blessing me so I can bless others. Yes! It's actually way more fun than that. You should be more excited. God cares for us. We enjoy it. We share it. Enjoy the life that Jesus has created you to live because when you put your faith in him, there is no better life. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for your word that even through this weird journal that's kind of strange, we can find true hope and meaning in Christ. We can be pointed to the one thing that gives our life purpose. Fear God, follow his ways. Glorify God, follow after Jesus. And maybe there's something in this sermon today, something in this illustration, someone in the room needed to hear that there's some things you gotta start filtering out of your life. Maybe there's some people in this room, they have been living for some of the things under the sun and they're like, I gotta gotta flip the script. I gotta start living for Jesus and glorifying him with all the things that I have. I don't know what someone needed to hear, but I really, really know that this is a true lesson for our life. And when we shift this, Man, we enjoy life more. Glorifying you, blessing others, and enjoying the life and things that you've given us. I love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.